So it's nice to be back here. I was at the first cleanup meeting. That's now the tenth. Has made a lot of progress. Thanks to the two people who have started it. They started a new field, which is the sort of interdisciplinary between many, many. It has been mentioned by Patrick Kunzinger, many areas of science. I like very much your talk. Very broad overview. Yet to be a bit quick. I will also be quick. But I think it's very important to see how these different fields of science get together. You mentioned one thing, uh, you know, about uh, technology and uh, medicine. It just happens that an organism is much more complicated than going to the moon. You may remember that Kennedy said, I want to go to the moon. Of course, it was possible. Curing cancer, that's another story. Because it's much, much more complex. It's still molecules, it's still physics, it's still thermodynamics. But it's a very complex system. And this we have to learn. We are all made of molecules. We are all depending on those things. And uh, someday we'll understand. But it uh, will take some time still. And since you mentioned also what quantum has to do, that's one can discuss that. But from Newton to Einstein, the difference is speed. From the, uh, inf the uh, quantum effects, it's size. You go from macroscopic to nanoscopic, and then your properties change. And in fact, one of my colleagues in Strasbourg now is coupling the energy of the vacuum with the molecules. It makes new levels. It's also something which may be quite interesting, but in conditions which are not living conditions. Okay, I've already spent some minutes, so I will use a few more. Okay, so what I want to show you today is I give you results. But uh, don't look too much into the structures, it's complicated. But the, the principles, the concepts are important. And I would like to show you that, in fact, supramolecular chemistry, one can say this year, 2017, is 50 years old. And uh, the Nobel Prize in 87 is 30 years old. But things have changed. And I would like, you to, show, I would like to show you how it has changed over the years into this field we are now mostly interested in is what we may call adaptive chemistry. So, as you know, very quickly, molecules are made from atoms with covalent bonds. The idea for supramolecular chemistry was that when molecules are constituted, they interact. So that's a new level beyond the molecule. And this led to the supramolecular chemistry with uh, the use, the design of objects which interact in a very specific way through non-covalent interactions. It looks, nowadays, it looks sort of trivial. Of course, it was always possible. But one had to build up the chemistry of how to make molecules from atoms, and then the chemistry of how to make larger entities from molecules interacting. Now, the features which were studied in these last 50 years are how do molecules recognize each other, recognition, how do they react with each other, and how can they carry each other through a barrier like a cell membrane. And the basis of molecular recognition is that first things have to interact, but it's not enough. And the very important, I think probably the most important notion that supramolecular chemistry brought to chemistry is that there is information. Recognition means information. So all molecules are an informed system. All organism is much more complex than a computer. All these things run on kinetics, on recognition forces, and so on. So one has to stress that chemistry is an information science also. And this uh, simplest way of describing that is a complementarity in structure and in interaction. And this was already introduced by Emil Fischer in 1894. He didn't call it that way. But he said things have to fit together like Schloss and Schlüssel. They have to fit together. An enzyme acts on its substrate when they fit. And that was, in fact, molecular recognition. Of course, at that time, uh, we didn't have all the means that Fisher worked without any instruments we had today. In fact, I wonder how he could do that, what he has done. Fantastic work. So, recognition, locks and keys, that's the story. And if you have uh, locks, for instance, the lock you should see in the middle there, this one, you have three keys, of course, the red one fits. So, the start of the work in this area was to try to play with locks and keys. And one way to do it is to try to first to make many, try many recognition processes. The first one which was studied is obviously the one which is the simplest. 
the simplest entity in three-dimensional space is a sphere. In Mendeleev's table, we have spheres, alkali cations, so we can try to figure out how to selectively bind alkali ions among the collection. And two of them are very important, sodium and potassium. This is what is important in an organism. I was interested in it at that time because I was interested in neuroscience. And for a chemist in the 1960s, neuroscience is sort of an impossible thing, except for one thing. This, the uh, action potential which propagates nerve influxes is sodium potassium changes across membranes. So this is how we started. How can we distinguish between spheres in a mixture of spheres of different sizes? And of course, one would then try to have selective binding with ions, what may call is spherical molecular recognition, and then we build this now old stuff, but just to indicate that in fact it's nano already. Many things chemists have done for many years before the, nano, the name nano came up was nano. This, for instance, is one nanometer, 10 angstroms, okay? And so you can make cages which have a cavity, you can design that, synthetic chemistry can do that. Now, as I said, that's old stuff, that is now trivial, but it's sort of an example that molecules are nano and that you can design them and make them in the laboratory. Now, uh, what can one do then? One important thing was to try to do transport processes because the action potential relies on transport of sodium potassium across nerve membranes. And so over the years, things were studied like carrier transmediated transport where a specific entity shuttles through a membrane and brings a, a substrate through the membrane selectively. The other way is the channel mediated. That's the most biologically more important one. And this has then been studied too. And uh, so these processes, they give you ideas, and it has been studied over the years, about how these mm, transport processes work, how you can design carriers, how you can design channels, separation procedures, and also understand this progressively more the physics and chemistry of biological transport processes. Applications are drug delivery, you know that very well, but it already, was already there at that time, targeting to take a sort of a molecule, which is a search group, which can pick up where to go, and gene transfer, which is the more recent way of looking at it. Now, let me just summarize a few applications. There are many, many, but just the ones we have been interested in over the years. First of all, molecular recognition, of course, is absolutely fundamental with, for drug discovery. What is a drug? A drug is a key for a biological lock and you want to make a key which just fits into the lock and not anywhere, not anywhere else. Now, of course, that is specificity, selectivity, and so on. And uh, so this is uh, why supermolecular chemistry has been of very great importance for drug design and for trying to understand how to make drugs. Just one example we have been interested in, one we call ITPP, not difficult, inositol trispyrophosphate, here it is. That's a drug we have been developing and which is now in phase two clinical studies in Zurich. It's a drug which binds to uh, red blood cells and makes them deliver more oxygen than normal. So it's interesting in all cases where you need more oxygen. This is cardiovascular disease, but also cancer, since you know the tumors are hypoxic. Now, uh, development of diagnostics, obviously the field of uh, trying to have selective binding and make a label out of it. This is good for diagnostics, you will see in a moment. Gene transfer, that was a process of uh, transfer through membranes, but a much more complicated one. But nevertheless, basically, it's a transport. And more recently, now, of course, biomaterials, I will show you an example, an example there. And also, we have recently found that a very trivial molecule we have been, we have been making 30 years ago is very interesting for actin polymerization, which means it acts on the cytoskeleton, and it makes cells push lamellipodia and so on, and very interesting results, but okay, I haven't time to get into all that, of course. So, this is an example of uh, the use in medical diagnostics. This is one of the first cryptans and cryptates we made, this one, where you have a shell of organic substances which absorb UV light. You have a europium ion in the middle, 
and this then emits a red light by absorbing UV light on the periphery, transferring the energy here, and that then is a sort of a nanobulb, a red bulb. This was then transformed into something used in, in, uh, in uh, hospitals by Jean Matisse, thanks to him, because we, have just, we were just studying the photophysics, but he thought there was an application, and he, he really, he bet his shirt on it. That was quite a strong statement for him to try to do it, and it was done, and now they have a machine which is called Cryptor here, which is now used in hospitals, and where, of course, this is the label for immunoproteins for diagnosis. Gene transfer, gene transfer, uh, we, have we have been studying uh, transfer in chemistry, transport, for many years. Then we had dropped it because we had done quite a lot of things. And then it came up again when gene transfer came about. And gene transfer, you know very well, I guess, what it is. It means that you want to take a piece of DNA and enter it into a cell, but you have to get it in. And to get it in, then you have to, you make synthetic vectors which sort of hide the DNA because DNA is very polar, doesn't want to go through membranes, and that brings it into the cell, and then it goes to the nucleus, and finally it makes the protein which is, uh, the, which is carried by the gene. This is important for uh, biotechnology, for gene therapy, and of course uh, we now know that there are a few cases which more and more work for, uh, for gene transfer and for curing. Uh, this is just one example we, de we developed. There were many people interested in making molecules which would bind to DNA and help them to go through membranes. We made this one, which we call BGTC. Pardon. Um, Bisguanidinium here. Tren, that is this unit. Cholesterol. Cholesterol is just the, gr the greasy thing which brings it into the membrane. And as you can see here, uh, you can see the transfer of uh, the um, here the transfection of human primary cells. What is blue is a transfection by beta galactosidase blue cells, and it works also in animals. This has been done with my, one of my brothers, who is a cell biologist and a medical person. This is uh, seeing here. He's interested in uh, um, cystic fibrosis, and so you can look here at the. Uh, this transfection of the here the human in the, in the epithelial cells in the mouse airways. Uh, just one thing, very quickly. That's a bit complicated, but I want to show one thing: the relationship between nanostructure and biological property. We have yet developed also these entities here, where you take an amino sugar and make it lipophilic by attaching some kind of a grease, some kind of a, of a molecule, which will make it soluble into membranes. Paramomycin, for instance, canamycin. And then you can see that there can be, they are all up, take siRNA up very well. Why siRNA? Because Sugars have a lot of OHs. RNA has one OH more than DNA, so it's quite a good wet for that. And when you look at the activity, you find out that the one, the paramomycin and the canamycin have a big difference. The paramomycin goes, helps DNA to go into cell, but at the same time also is a blocking agent, a silencing agent, whereas the other one is not. Why is it so? If you look at the effect of the nanostructure, you can find the following that this is a lamellar structure, and that's an onion structure. And the idea is that the lamellar structure release much more easily the agent than the onion structures. And that is probably the origin of this activity, where in this case, on the left-hand side, you have both siRNA uptake and silencing, whereas this here is much is uptake, but does not do the silencing job. Just an example. Now, how use molecular recognition for uh, directing, um, for making larger bodies, for directing, for instance, liposomes in a re mole molecular recognition fashion? Look, if you take these two recognition groups, this is the uh, barbiturate type of derivative, that's a triamino pyridine or pyrimidine, this one, and makes three hydrogen bonds. So that's a recognition process with three hydrogen bonds, a donor, an acceptor, a donor of, of hydrogen bonds. If you, take, if you make then liposomes 
in which you add these units with a lipophilic tail, a lipophilic tail, a hydrophilic spacer, and then the recognition group. You make vesicles with one, vesicles with the other, and then you see what happens when you mix them. What happens there is the following. Before mixing, separately, each of them makes just rather nice, well, what you expect, vesicles. When you mix them, after 10 minutes, you get an aggregation, quite strong one, and when you wait longer, you have fusion. So this uh, way to interact with one another leads eventually to fusion of the vesicles by very simple molecules. Of course, the biological fusion of cells is much more complicated, but you can do it with simple, chemically well-defined entities. So this can be interesting for what you might call supramolecular galenics, where you use this basic interaction processes to make, to set up systems which would then help non-viral gene delivery, drug delivery, targeting in general, and so on. Now, um, the last example in design uses bricks which are of organic chemistry nature and cement, which is inorganic. That is why we call them metallo-supramolecular type of entities. The components are ligand molecules, organic molecules able to bind metal ions. The connectors are metal cations, which bring them together in a coordination-specific way. And the metal ions, so to say, are the ones which read out the information present in the molecule and bring them together in a very specific fashion, depending on the structure of the ligand and the type of metal cation. When men additionally also notice that metal ions can be a sort of an information dot. You can oxidize, reduce, excite with light, and so on. That is for nanoscience and nanotechnology of interest. So let me just show you a few examples of these supramolecular structures brought about by interaction between organic molecules and metal ions. We have made double, pardon, we have made double helices, triple helices, grid types where you have six molecules, three horizontal, three vertical, and the crossings are occupied by the midline, which bring the whole thing together. You can make nano cylinders like this one. Also, you just mix and you get. In other words, if the design is well done, you get the object you have designed it for. And these are some just nice structures, you know, just to show you that one can make a lot of nice structures. These are the ones we made now many years ago, but nowadays things much more complicated have been made. We can now, and chemists are now able to make very complicated structures, for instance, topologically complicated, like the ones with the Nobel Prize in 2016, Fraser Stoddard, Ben Feringa, and one of my former students, Jean-Pierre Sauvage, got uh, by using this way of bringing molecules together through middle ion binding. Now, this is a well-developed field now. And just an example, because we speak nano, what about nano containers? Okay, what can you do? You take this molecule, you synthesize it. You synthesize this one, a long one, rigid, linear, a flat one. You bring in the correct middle ion, and it assembles automatically, nothing else to do and you get then even people sitting inside their houses here. And this could be, for instance, a drug or whatever. You can imagine things. This is just to demonstrate that it's possible. Of course, if you want to do something useful with it, usable, then you have to make it for a given substance. But this is just to demonstrate that you can do it. Now, this is the first part of my lecture. OK, all right, good. <laughs> no protest. Up to now, I spoke about design. You design your objects, and this is still a very important thing. Design it, and then design it correctly so it does what you want it to do. But that's one step. The next step would be, why not go a bit more complicated and go to selection? You still have to design things, but you let the system select what it needs to build itself up. And this then opens the possibility for adaptation, because if the system can build itself up, it can maybe change its structure, its composition as a function of the environment, adapt to it, and that opens towards adaptive chemistry. I would now like to show you a little bit about that. There's a lot I could say, but I think just 
to give you some ideas. So, first of all, the first step was to recognize that there was something in supramolecular chemistry which had been left on the side because it was obvious. You know, over, often in science, things which are obvious, you just don't think about because they're obvious. But sometimes then you realize that one should think about because this obvious thing has properties which, if they are developed, can lead to something else. And what is it? Rather simple. Supramolecular entities result from bringing things together by weak interactions, and therefore it can exchange. It can break, reform, break, reform. So it has the possibility to undergo a variation in constitution by exchanging the bricks from which it is made. And this then leads to what you may call a dynamic, non-covalent chemistry. Supramolecular chemistry is by nature, by essence, dynamic, because the interactions are Libai. But then you cannot do another step, which is a sort of total change from what you have learned over years. What we have learned over years is to make stable molecules. So the question comes up, can we make molecules which are unstable on design? That sounds terrible at the beginning, huh? It sounds horrible, really. You don't want molecules which break apart. But what about when you do it? So can we make that, indeed, if we introduce in molecules reversible chemical bonds, covalent reversible bonds, then we can hope to have a dynamic covalent chemistry. And this then, when you wrap it up together, leads to what I call with a little bit com complicated name, but it such expresses the reality. If you put the supramolecular dynamics, exchange possibilities, which is natural for supramolecular chemistry, and the dynamic covalent, where you have intentionally to introduce the fact that you want it to exchange, then you come to a dynamic chemistry of the constitution of the chemical object. It's not dynamics of a motion. It's not the dynamics of a reaction. It's a dynamics in the constitution. And this is what I call constitutional dynamic chemistry. And this, by variation in constitution, allows for adaptation uh, to adaptive chemistry. So, what is that good for? First of all, it makes mixtures. The nice name for mixtures is a dynamic library. You know, 50 years ago, when I started my career, when you had a mixture, you throw it in a sink. You cannot do anything with it. Nowadays, thanks to the engineers, thanks to physics, thanks to computing, thanks to all these other sciences, we now can analyze complex mixtures. And now it, be, it makes sense to try to study it. So you get dynamic diversity. And then, of course, if you have diversity, you can hope to be able to select. Three main roads of development have been followed. Uh, we'll be very brief on each. One. Can you use that for developing a way for designing and for finding out biologically active substances? Can one make dynamic nanostructures? S nanostructures which are not stable but which fall apart but can then reassemble in a given way depending on the environment. And uh, materials of dynamic type, especially polymers, which I will mention. These are then what you might call adaptive nanostructures. That's perhaps the next step in the nanoscience and the, also the type of things you are interested in. Make these nano entities dynamic so they can adjust, they can adapt. First, we have to study a type of reaction which is a reversible and simple one and broad one in its scope. And this obviously is the condensation of an amine with a carbonyl, methylamine. Looks very simple, trivial, it's not so simple. In fact, imine formation is a complicated process, but let's forget about the complexities. Just notice that this is a reversible reaction here where you form an imine with water and you go, can go back. What can we do with it? Let's first look at the design, the search for biologically active substances. Let's go back to Fisher, Emil Fisher. Drug design ideally is making the right key for the biological lock. But you have to know the lock. You have to design the key, and it has to work. It's very exciting, because if it works, you understand. But it may be very long. So came now the people who, I hear I'm very schematic, things which are very much used now in pharma companies, they say, OK, forget about exact design of the key. We make 100,000 keys, and we try them all. And if you are lucky, one of them will more or less fit. 
and then our good medical, uh, our good medicinal chemists, they will improve it. Okay, can be good. But it's a bit disappointing if you have spent many years of your life trying to understand recognition, that people come and say, we make a mixture, we try them all, and if we are lucky, we find it. Not so much a fun. So can you combine the two? That's the idea. Can you make a dynamic combinatorial chemistry? I will come back to what that is, where you make fragments of keys. If that happens, you can merge the power of combinatorics, many, many, many entities, and the power of informatics, information. How can you do that? You can do that in the following way. Suppose you have a set of components, bricks, pieces, where there is a little dot here, which is a reversible fun a a functional group which can make reversible bonds. If you mix those things together, what do you get? A horrible mess. That's very, very combinations, many combinations. In other words, by mixing these together, you have access to all combinations of the entities you put together. So what do you do with it? What you do, you call, you take your telephone, you call Monsieur Le Chatelier, the principle of mass action, old stuff. What does he tell you? He tells you that if you add the receptor, it will bind selectively the best substrate. So the receptor will do the driving. The lock will assemble its key. Now that looks like a fantastic and the solution to everything. As you know, all, there are no panacea in science and we could discuss what could be limitations. But nevertheless, the important thing is that indeed, by principle of thermodynamics, very simple ones, if you have a complex mixture where all entities can exchange, the lock will assemble its key. And this can then be used for, very many, for many type of uh, interactions like enzyme inhibitors and so on. And I give you just one example here. Take carbonic anhydrase. Carbonic anhydrase is an enzyme which interconverts CO2 water and carbonic acid. Inhibitors have been studied, and a very good inhibitor, one nanomolar, is this very simple molecule, which has a sulfonate, a sulfonamide, binding to the zinc of the active site, a benzylamine binding to the hydrophobic wall, and here, a connection. Now, this connection is an amide. That is not really well reversible. But if you assume that this interaction and this interaction are dominant, then you can say, okay, let's transform this into an imine, which is different in terms of properties, but nevertheless may be a minor uh, perturbation. And then you can set up, you can generate a set of interconverting type of uh, constituents. You take four amines, three aldehydes, one amine is pencilamine, you know the answer, but you want just to see if you can find the answer you already know. And here you use this sulfonamide with its uh, sulfonate, sulfonamide of benzaldehyde. Three times four is 12, and you look at all 12 combinations which can be possible here. One of them, this one, is closest to the very good inhibitor. So what do you expect? You expect the system to generate this one if you add carbonic anhydrase. So at the beginning, when you look at the HPLC trace of the mixture, you have 12 constituents. Let me just look at two of them. The one which is the one which is we are looking for, closest to the very good inhibitor, and another one which shares a component, the sulfonamide group. Then you add the carbonic anhydrase. And what happens? What you expected, uh, what we were hoping for, of course, you are never sure before you did the experiment. Now, this unit is now very big compared to the other one. In other words, carbonic anhydrase has amplified in this mixture the proportion of the right key. And it means that you have an adaptation of this dynamic set of molecules in response to the biological effector, which is here, the enzyme carbonic anhydrase. All right, obviously, this kind of reversible bonds can be interesting for dynamic drugs, what you might call dynamic drugs, where you attach drugs to a substrate in a reversible fashion, in a covalent reversible. So of course, you can do it also by non-covalent supramolecular attachment, by recognition, but you can do it by chemical reactions, making here, uh, uh, making here CN double bonds, which then can go back and forth. 
and that can be in principle used for controlled release of drugs, maybe, maybe making dynamic component libraries of drugs, combinatorial drugs, that is of course a concept which probably is very complicated because you have to show that any combination is non-toxic. That's a big deal, but it may be interesting. And in fact, with a company in Geneva, Firmanish, we have tried to make dynamic perfumes, you know? You add perf perfumes to it and you they release really slowly. We have even thought that you may have a perfume, in the morning you smell violet, in the evening you smell the rose, depending on the rate at which it uh, re is released. So, now what about materials? Dynamic materials is also one of these ideas which looks stupid, because you say, okay, what do you want to make materials that are dynamic? If she, this is a, a dynamic material, it falls apart. She doesn't want that. But maybe there are properties other materials don't have. So, um, dynamic polymers, this is an example we can look at, and we call those dynamers, dynamic polymers. Dynamic polymers can be supramolecular or molecular. Molecular ones, the monomers are linked by reversible covalent bonds, imines and things like that, okay? The supramolecular ones are made by recognition. So, the difference between the two, both of them are dynamic polymers, but these ones, the connection between the monomers is a reversible chemical reaction, and in these ones, this connection is a recognition feature. So let's have a look, especially at the supramolecular polymers, which have now developed a lot. Not too much in detail, but just to make you s feel what is going on. If you take a monomer which has recognition groups at each end, this is a tartaric acid in the middle, this is a donor, acceptor, donor of hydrogen bonding. The complement to DAD is, of course, ADA. So this one, derived from uracil, is ADA. If you mix this with that, you get a supramolecular polymer main chain. And this is sticking together by formation of three hydrogen bonds between these two monomers. This monomer with this one makes three hydrogen bonds, and you get a long chain. Incidentally, that's a solid, that's a solid, that's a liquid crystal. Already something interesting. But I don't want to insist on that. What I would like to show you, this is also something which many of us probably have experienced, that takes a long time to go from a basic idea to something applicable. And let me just indicate here that when we published the first paper, the concept of supramolecular polymers, this was in 1990 here. So what has come out of it? This is just a picture of this type of materials we get. What has happened is the following. In 2013, in October 2013, about a little bit more than three years ago, I got an email from a small company. And they said, look, we have used supramolecular polymers to make biomaterials, biocompatible polymers. And furthermore, they use them, that company is Xeltis, headquarters in Zurich, and the lab is in, in the Netherlands. They have made a material out of which you can make cardiac implants for reconstruction of the heart of children who have a congenital heart disease. This was the idea, but it has been done. Here is a little girl, Dominica, who was implanted now. This was the 33rd, sorry, 23rd of October 2013. She was implanted at the Bakulev Scientific Center for Cardiovascular Surgery in Moscow by Professor Leo Bokeria. And she's fine. This is now three years, so has quite a background on it. So this is something fantastic when you have worked on a concept and suddenly you know that there's a little girl running around with that in their heart. But it's not just one, because now it has been done with more than 10, in fact. And more recently, they made now also the same people made heart valves, which have been implanted in 2016 in Budapest. So you see, this is also one way where, okay, we all would like to have applications very quickly, but it's complicated. And you have to have the money, and you have to have the people who think about, and you have to have the physician, the surgeon, who is ready to do it. Not so simple, but it happens. And I think what we have to do is to develop basic research, hoping that out of that, somewhere around the world, it will be, there will be an application. I didn't suspect this application. I knew that there was something interesting which could be interesting for the biomaterials, 
But who do you know? What do you develop? Difficult to know. So another thing is self-healing materials. What I show you here is a, a one which is probably interesting for, let's say, um, practical uses like home and personal care and so on. But it could be interesting also for bi as biomaterial. You see here, that's a film which can be cut in two. That's a polymeric film, a dynamic polymeric film, cut in two. You superimpose the two ends and you press with your finger, just a little bit like this, a minute. And you can stretch and it sticks. You can stretch it and it is almost the same strength as before cutting it, before, after. This is probably we haven't, we haven't pressed long enough or not strong enough. But this is uh, very simple. And the compounds this is made from are both in the Aldrich catalog. You just have to mix the right ones. <laughs> so look, chemistry has still a lot to do. OK. Now, what about this was supramolecular. Now, what about molecular covalent dynamic polymers? We can, this can be done by taking a bisaldehyde, a bisamine, and you make a polyimine. For a chemist, this is trivial. You just mix them and you get polyimines, of course. Let's forget about this one. Now, what can, be do, what can we do with this? Let's have a look. If you make dynamic polymers, they can, of course, recombine their components. This is best shown here. Suppose you make a film where you have a dicarbonyl A and a diamine B. That makes a B, a B, a B, a B film. Then you make another film, which has another dicarbonyl and another diamine, A prime and B prime. A prime, B prime, A prime, B prime, A prime, B prime polymer. Now you mix, you put them on top of each other. What will happen? What can happen at least is the following. If this is a dynamic connection, then of course, in principle, you can cleave between A and B and between A prime and B prime and recombine A with B prime and A prime with B. So you make two new combinations which were not present in the starting film. If one of these two new combinations has a property, a novel property, you will see it. So let's look at imines. First of all, let's have a look at, uh, this is the best illustration, optical features. We have done it for mechanical features, for self-healing and so on. But let's look at optical features. Opticals, you see, that's convincing. Okay, so you have the two films, AB, A prime, B prime. You superimpose at some point, and where they are superimposed, in principle, you can generate A, B prime, A, B prime, and A prime, B. Two new combinations. If one of these two combinations has a color or a fluorescence, you will see it. It will, you must see it. So, this was done by collaborators which uh, were sent to my lab in Strasbourg by Mitsui Chemics in Japan. They were a very forward-looking company trying to see what dynamic polymers can be used for, what are the interests. So, uh, I seen also the Japanese, so Japanese na na like nice little pictures, like for instance this cat. The head and the ears of the cat is AB. The moustache the eyes and the inside of the ears is A prime, B prime. You superimpose. Nothing has happened yet. And then you heat and you get color and you get fluorescence. So that proves that at the interface between the two films, the recombination has occurred. You have generated these other combinations and one of them was colored and it was fluorescent. And so you see it that it happened. That indicates that you can, at the interface between two dynamic films, recombine the components. You can even think of writing information with a heating laser at the interface. And if you make a middle failure stack, then you can read and write. In th you can write in three dimensions. Okay, so this can also be applied to biological polymers. Here, I will be quick. We have done it with all of them, and uh, a number of them are now being developed. So first of all, you can make dynas. I like that name because it's not DNA, but it's DNA, dynamic nucleic acids, where the connection between the uh, 
nuclear, there are no nucleotides anymore, but the connection between the nucleobase bearing unit is, com is uh, dynamic. And so it can, dis it can disconnect, reconnect, disconnect, reconnect, and change in according to what is present. For instance, if you add here I, uh, polyanions in presence of uh, this dynamic unit which is positively charged, then you can get uh, polymerization driven by the interaction with the substrate. Dynamic peptoids can be made. They're not peptides really, because you have to make, you have to introduce a function which is, relative, which is reversible, but it can be done. So it's a peptoid, an analog of a peptide, but where the connections between the amino acid components are reversible. That could be interesting because for the moment that is still wishful thinking, but if you can make sort of protein analogs where the binding between the amino acids is reversible, maybe that protein can adapt to changes in whatever is around, to binding, to substrates, to uh, maybe going from one phase water to a membrane and things like that. And dynamic sugars also can be made, as you have seen here, this is just one example. So one can, all the three main classes, nucleic acids, peptides, and uh, sugars can be made dynamic in principle. There's still a lot to do. We have just only looked at just the surface of what can be done. And there are now a few people continuing. For instance, uh, the uh, dynamic peptoids have also been studied by Anna Hirsch, who was one of my former postdocs. She's now in, she was in German, in uh, Holland, and now she's in Saarbrücken, I think. Huh? Where were you? Good. <laughs> Just started today. Oh, good. <laughs> okay. So, chemistry has been changing. Molecular, we all have to be molecular chemists. We have to know how to make molecules. That's what we, what we can do. That's a fantastic power. That's why I'm a chemist. A chemist can make things which never existed. It's fantastic. Make molecules which nobody had made before. That's fantastic. But this is what we have to do. But on this basis, we can then develop the next step, which is planning the molecules so that they can bind together in a given supramolecular entity. This has to be organized. We have seen cases where they organize by themselves, depending on how you design your components. Dynamics can be introduced. For supramolecular, the dynamics are by essence present. For molecular, you have to introduce these dynamics through reversible covalent bonds, and then they can adapt. If they are dynamic, if they can exchange their bricks, they will do so in a f as a function of the environment. This is the way towards more and more complex forms of matter. So that is our journey. We are now mostly interested in adaptive chemistry. And I must close with this, because yesterday we made Europe again. I was very worried. <laughs> Sci science, science is international. Scientists, they know that it's international. Science, they know that there are no borders. But in Europe, we try to build up something which nobody has ever tried in the history of mankind, making people get together without a war, just to try to understand each other. Switzerland is not part of Europe, but Basel is the window of Switzerland to Europe. <laughs> and I wanted to mention also Paracelsus was mentioned earlier. Paracelsus was, of course, in Basel but he got thrown out of Basel huh? because he was burning middle books and he didn't like the medical people at that time. Then he came to Strasbourg, but he was a sort of a, a guy, you know, who was a bit shaking the system up. He had also to leave Strasbourg. But we have the letter of citizenship of Paracelsus also. <laughs> so there's another connection between Basel and Strasbourg. Thank you very much.
Don't forget that the European hymn is the best, the nicest song, Oder an die Freude, Beethoven's Ninth Symphony. This is the original manuscript. Not the manuscript, a photo of the manuscript. <laughs> Thank you so much, Jean Marilene. Maybe people have questions now. Sure, sure. Mm. Is there anyone who has a question? Everyone is flabbergasted by what you said. I was a bit fast. Oh, uh, there. I, oh, look, I have five minutes left. That's I the first it. time that happens to me. <laughs> Hello. Uh, yes, I'm here. Yeah. Uh, yeah, thank you very much for this exciting lecture. I'm also from Strasbourg. <laughs> but uh, so the, the question is about uh, the use of um, molecules which are not stable uh, for nanomedicine. So uh, in case of molecules which are not stable, they can create maybe other molecules. You, can, uh, you were talking about library, etc. cetera. Uh, do you think it can be a limitation, for example, for FDA approval? because it can generate molecules which we don't know. And yeah. this, uh, d d this may pose problem because we, for example, inject something which will e sure. make an evolution inside the body and create something unknown. Yeah, totally right, and that's the main limitation for the use. That's what I call dynamic drugs. Huh? We have pieces yeah. which can get together and they generate, one of them may be very active. No, now the question is, also for the regulatory bodies, can one accept that toxicology done on the mixture is valid. It's not easy to know because depending on the organ, it will be different. On the other hand, I also think that these regulatory bodies should not shoot in their own foot. Sometimes they do because the many regulations right now, are, they are so, string, so strong that the prices are what we saw at the previous talk. So we have to arrive, and in, U in the U.S. it's starting. The U.S. has relaxed some of the rules. The FDA has relaxed some rules. In Europe, we have to do the same. We have too many of these precautionary principles. I'm personally totally opposed to the precautionary principle. That's another thing which I, you know, the French have instituted it and inscribed in the Constitution. That's stupid. Huh? You have okay. to be careful. You have to be, pay attention. You know what I say usually, you want to cross a street, okay? So, if you apply caution, you look left, look right, no car coming, you cross. If you apply the precautionary principle, you never cross the street. It can always happen. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> No more questions? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Heinberger yeah. um, and then Michael Eaton. Healthcare has been slower than in technology in semiconductors and telecommunications. And you mentioned one reason is regulation. Do you think there's another reason that maybe uh, treating intellectual property differently could also change the speed and the progress in sharing more than being uh, so concerned about protecting it? Yeah, certainly. The thing is, of course, one would have to find a socially acceptable way of having enough money getting to the company doing the experiments, because that's very expensive, and the way to make it available to everybody. So it's something which will come up. This will come up, obviously. The, you must have a sort of a compromise between min money making because the company needs it and because they're shareholders. Now you see shareholders, oh, damn shareholders. No, but you know, they put their money in, so somebody has to be done. But you still have to also to combine that with what we heard about uh, friends in Africa bringing drugs to people who can't pay for this has been done with HIV uh, in some extent, where the AIDS has been made uh, less expensive. The other main problem, the difference between information technology and life technology, is that life technology is much more complex. 
A semiconductor, we know exactly how it functions. So. Physics it has a property that when you understand your system, you can calculate everything. <coughs> it works. Uh, so when you look, the, uh, the gravity waves, Einstein had predicted them. They were found. Not because I have the theory which is behind it. Uh, semiconductors going to the moon, sure. During cancer, that's another problem, much more complex. Also, perhaps because in evolution, we were put together by evolution in a very tinkering way. Huh? François Jacob said, le bricolage moléculaire, molecular tinkering, huh? sort of thinking pieces, and it works, it does, uh, and so on. And this is why we are so complicated, and one also, in a, maybe, in the biological organism, they're correcting things. When you make a mistake, there's something there which will correct. When you have a wrong base in DNA, there's something coming, taking it out, another one bringing it in. So it's very complex. An engineer would never dream of that. An engineer would make one strand, another strand, and they work. Huh? So life is complicated. That's the problem. We are a bit too complicated. And we so are a system out of equilibrium also. That's another problem. So, <laughs> Jean-Marie, there what? is another question from Mike Leeton. Yeah. <clears throat> I was just going to ask, um, from a philosophical point, really, how far can this technology explain the origins of life? Can you take it that far? Sorry? Could you? Could, how far can this technology be taken? Can it help towards the origins of life, essentially? Oh, mm. that's, of course, a, a <laughs> question which is underlying every's mind. And, uh, in fact, my doctor father, Guy Risson, said, when you, can, when you get old enough, you begin to think about the origin of life. <laughs> because you get concerned about it, yeah? So, uh, yeah, I think everything uh, you're building up from scratch, more and more complicated entities, it is there. And then the other people who do what you may call prebiotic chemistry, I mean, chemistry with the units which could have existed at the start of life. And then there are the people who ask the basic questions, why is it as it is? When Albert Eschenwasser did fantastic work on the question, a rather simple question, but you had to be a very uh, top synthetic chemist. Why has DNA ribose and not a hexose? You can try to answer that theoretically. The other thing is you make it. He made it, and you see why. Okay, I leave you, you should read people, these papers by Albert Eschenmoser. So chemistry can do that. Chemistry can ask a question, and then rather than dreaming about the solution, you try it out, you make it. Now, the origin of life, of course, molecules, supramolecular entities, more and more complex entities. We're now working on systems which are out of equilibrium, far from living, not exactly living systems, but they are important for that. And a lot of things like that can happen. For instance, something, if I may allow another 30 seconds. Yes. One of the things which was very funny <laughs> is that physicists have been very excited about coffee stain. You drop coffee and you get a stain. Why do you get a stain? So they calculated lots of things. And of course the stain comes from the fact that when the drop evaporates, the non-soluble particles in the coffee deposit at the periphery. So we put in a drop a dynamic system. Okay? In this dynamic system, one constituent was less soluble than the others. So when the drop evaporates, the one which is less soluble goes to the outskirts and deposits so that you have inside the, when the drop has evaporated from the periphery to the center, you have a, just a spatial separation of the least soluble to the most soluble in the middle. So you know, you can, these are the kind of things which may well happen. No? When you're at the beginning of life, you have a drop which evaporates. If these things can recombine, you have a region which has a given composition, another region with another composition, so, all these phenomena come into play, but we are still, of course, very far from getting there. As a chemist, a biologist, we should, I think, be convinced that we will get there, that life is a... Like Arthur Kornberg, who suddenly wasn't somebody you could not say who would be biased towards chemistry. Arthur Kornberg said, life is a chemical problem. I like that. <laughs> no solution for the moment. <laughs> I think, Jean-Marie, next, next time we will ask you for a two-hour lecture.
because it's so fascinating. Zero now. And your human uh, humor in this is so fantastic. And I thank you very, very much that you came to speak to us. And we thank you, both of you, for creating Kina.